introduction. Um, yeah, so talk about array computing in Python. So, you know, mainly as a NumPy developer, you know, starting from NumPy, but I'll try to see like, you know, what, what else is there besides NumPy. Um, yeah, I'll start with a very, very short introduction. Um, yeah, so I've been contributing to NumPy and SciPy for about a decade. I've also been on the you know, board of NumFocus for six years. So I was at the start of the, the PyData conference series, uh, which was partly set up to support these projects and to grow the community. Uh, and since about one month, I'm the director of Quantsight Labs, which is basically a, a startup company that tries to hire people that work on like NumPy, SciPy, Jupyter, Pandas, Dask, all these kind of projects that you're probably using. Um, so if you want to contribute to these projects or you know, you want, you're interested in um, making work on these kind of open source packages like a job rather than like, I, I'm going to try this in my evening a few times, um, or you work for a company that relies on these projects and you, you, know, you might want to help them make make them sustainable, uh, grow them, uh, please come talk to me afterwards. Uh, so we'll start about 20 years ago, I'm well, 25 by now. Um, so Python is uh, you know, the early 90s, and pretty soon after, you know, numeric got invented. So numeric is the, you know, the first thing that was basically an n-dimensional array in, uh, in Python. And you know, then for eight years, you know, not much happened. Numeric grew a little bit, uh, and then someone, you know, wasn't happy with numeric anymore because it didn't basically it didn't work well for small arrays. Uh, so they invented num array that was faster on small arrays, uh, and that's about when I started using NumPy. Uh, so you saw this thing like there's numeric, there's num array, which they're pretty much the same for a beginning user. Which one do I have to use? So luckily, someone wrote NumPy at that point to kind of bring it all back together. And then for a decade, like that's that's all we had, uh, and you know there were a few related things that were invented, like Tiano in 2008 for like the first um, you know deep learning framework of this kind, I think, uh, and then Numba to speed things up a little bit. Uh, but it's really like from the last three four years that there's kind of this explosion of you know new libraries that you know do different kinds of array computing. So if you're on distributed arrays, you, you know, you're probably using Dask. If you're using deep learning, you're probably using TensorFlow or PyTorch or maybe even MXNet or QPy with Chainer. Uh, and then you have a, a new library for sparse arrays, and it kind of goes all over the place. Uh, so you know, if that keeps on continuing, you know, we're all in for a lot of trouble. Uh, so I want to talk about, you know, what, what we're as a, as a NumPy team trying to do to kind of you know, deal with this explosion of different libraries that all don't talk to each other. Um, maybe a question, how many of you do deep learning? Like a third or so, right? You probably have had the problem that you, know, you want to do some computer vision, let's say, and you know, there's just been a new algorithm like you know, faster RCNN a couple of years ago, and it's, it was built in cafe, right? And now all your other code is in TensorFlow. So do you switch to CAFE? Do you not use the algorithm at all? Like this, there are all these little silos that don't talk to each other. Right? So that's a problem we're trying to solve. Um, and, and here is the first example of you know, what, that, what that can look like. So if you have some code, uh, I don't know. I'll just point with my hand. Uh, so if you have some code, and you know, it just does something useful, right? and it uses NumPy functions. Right? Normally, you would expect to feed that NumPy arrays, right? You can't feed it like a TensorFlow array. Um, so, if we if we time that, like it, this little function takes 21 milliseconds. So now I make a new array uh, of QPy. So QPy is basically NumPy for GPUs. Right? There's a couple of those, like PyTorch is very similar, but QPy is the most like a standalone library about the size of NumPy with almost an identical API. So this now is living on my NVIDIA GPU. And I can now feed it into this same function, and all of a sudden, it's six times faster. Now, that's kind of nice, because I didn't have to change my function. But this, this wasn't really possible until today. 
Uh, so I'm going to explain to you after like, how this actually works. <laughs> and then you know, how you can start using it. Uh, here's another one. So if you use Dask, right? Dask is this library that basically provides you an array, but under the hood, it's like a collection that can live in, on different machines, and that transparently like, distributes your data over different machines, so you can do things at a really large scale. But normally, you would have to adapt all your code, you know, because you, you start with a small data sample, you, know, you build it in NumPy, and then uh, you have to rewrite all your code to use Dask calls. Uh, but what you see here is you know, some linear algebra, right? You just feed it an array, and you get you know, some arrays Q and R back to do some QR decomposition. Um, now, if you, if you do that with Dask, normally you would have to find the Dask equivalent that does QR decomposition. But now with this example, you can just use the NumPy function, and in the end, you still get your Dask array back. OK, so I just want to point out you, you should try this at home or here. Uh, it seems like we have good Wi-Fi, so <laughs> this, will, this will download quite a few, uh, quite a few packages. Uh, but if you just want to try this, it um, works the same in pip if you're a pip user, but I assume most people use Conda. Um, I just installed the latest versions of NumPy, Dask, and JupyterLab. Um, and then if you have a GPU on your computer, uh, you want to install uh, QPy in this case. Um, it's only the, what I just showed you is only supported in QPy 6, or, which will come out like next month or so. But you can install it with this command. So the first release candidate is out. And then the last important thing is in NumPy 1.16, all of this works. So that's the current version of NumPy. Um, but you have to set this, experiment, uh, this uh, environment variable before you start. So it will become default in a future version, probably in about two months or so. Uh, but if you want to try it today, you have to set this. OK, so what do we actually want to achieve with, uh, with this whole exercise? Uh, we want to take the NumPy API and kind of separate it from the rest of NumPy, from let's call it the execution <laughs> engine. So you can call a NumPy function and then basically route it to TensorFlow or PyTorch or QPy or whatever. Um, because what these libraries do, you know, have done already is basically they looked at NumPy and said, ah, oh, that's kind of nice, but I want it on a GPU or something. So they just copied the API and then made some slight changes, and, and then, you know, now we have a duplicate, right? And we actually have five or six duplicates today. So we wanted to give them a, an option and future libraries that come along to say, like, hey, I, I don't need to just copy-paste this whole API and then re-implement everything. I just, I can use this API and just plug into it. And that will help because right now we have like, you know, all these array libraries, but we only have one SciPy and we have, uh, you know, one scikit-learn, right? And if we don't do anything, like in two years, we may have, you know, SciPy for TensorFlow and we may have SciPy for PyTorch, and then it will come, you know, everything takes five times more effort. So we basically want to go from this, where you have all these libraries that consume arrays and that basically have to like use each individual one to this situation where they just talk to numpy and you can still talk direct but you can just talk to numpy and then go to the library that you want all right so how does that all work um OK, we'll start, start simple with a single, uh, I'll talk about a single function, because most of, most of NumPy and most of you know, data science is just using functions. Um, so if you look at a function, you have a signature and a function body. Right? Signature is just this one line that defines your function, and it has a number of parameters and keywords. Right? And the function body is everything else. Right? And that everything else just doesn't doesn't tell you what you can feed in. That's the signature, but it tells you how it then behaves. Right? So, and for NumPy, these can be two types of functions. Like the distinction usually doesn't matter to you as a user, but you, you know, there's these thing called ufunks or universal functions. Those are the ones that ha that are all look the same. They have an act D type, an out argument, and you know, they kind of built with standard machinery. And everything that's not a ufunc is like usually all slightly different because it, it doesn't fit nicely in the universal function pattern. 
so for both of these types of functions, this, this works now. And before, it used to work only for ufunks because it was much easier with this you know, standard pattern. So what we do now is we basically separated the function signature from the function body. So we kind of copy it over conceptually. And then we kind of check the input argument. So if the first argument to a function is an array, um, then we check if it has this array function attribute. Right? And if it does, you know, we basically hand over execution of everything to whatever's in, in that array function attribute. Right? So if you're now QPy or TensorFlow, you, know, you can just add to your own tensor or n-dimensional array object this array function thing and then say, like, you know, just use my implementation. Right? So it, it allows you to replace the whole implementation of NumPy with your own. Um, so at the moment, this works for all functions, and it works for ND array methods. So if you have code that just uses that, um, you're basically good to go today. If you have like complicated like uh, classes or decorators or something that are within NumPy, those are those you can't yet overwrite. So th those you would then still have to use from the actual library you want to be executing your code with. All right, and let's see if we can switch to a notebook. No. Is this readable? No, eh? Is it readable like this? No. That's good. Okay. All right. So let's import some things and just tell us what version it is. Uh, I'll publish this later, by the way, so I'll put my slides. I assume that you're distributing all the slides, right? Yeah. Good. You can also put it in the Ah, yes. Um, OK, so this is the example I showed you. Um, so let's go I'd explain that. So let's not go through it quickly. And first, I'll, I'll show you how to check if this actually works for a particular function. So just use the double question mark to show the source code. Easiest way to show the source code. Um, so here you see the signature. Right? And the line above it, it says array function dispatch. Right? That means it's implemented. And the way this, this function signature copying work, works, it's with this one decorator. So if you'd be writing your own library, you want to be using that decorator. All right. Let's hide that. So now I wanted to try that on just some function that I wrote. Uh, because you know, that's, in the end, you know, what, what you're probably most interested in. So I took a function from, from SciPy that I was familiar with, and that's just a, a simple function doing a t-test. And I first just copied the thing as is. And the only line I copied out, I commented out, was this one, the, the as array one. Because what that does, and you'll see that in most functions, probably not in your own code, but in library code, right? it checks if something is a, is a NumPy array. If it's not, it, it converts it into one. Yeah, that, that kind of defeats the whole purpose, right? Yeah, so I co copied that one, I commented that one out, but the rest is all the same. So this is basically what you'll find in SciPy as well. But it's a standard code that does some, you know, it does some checks for NANDs, uh, it calculates some mean, you know, variance, square root, um, and then in the end, it you know uses some distribution to calculate the actual statistic we're interested in. And I inserted, the one thing I inserted here was a print to check that, you know, we're actually getting, uh, you know, if we feed in a, a NumPy array, we get a NumPy array at the end. And if we feed in a Dask array, we get a Dask array at the end. So, you know, here we just create some random numbers. Um, you know, so 100 random numbers. Feed them, you know, split them into two columns. So we compare column A with column B. Right? And then we do a t-test on that. Right? And then we get some result that says, hey, we get, we get a p-value here. It's not really interesting what the p-value is, but um, you get some value out. So now we do that the same thing for Dask. Right? So here it will tell you 
Now you get a dask array. Yeah, that's what we printed. And okay, so it kind of works, but it, you know, there's one tricky bit with dask. Um, it looks a bit weird. So if you look at the statistic here, it tells you dask.array with something, blah blah blah. But if you if you read the whole thing, there's no actual values. Because you have to remember that Dask is kind of this distributed, um, distributed array object, and it, you know, it kind of builds up a graph of what you want to do, and it only executes it when you tell it to. So at the end, to make this work, we have to do one thing that's specific to Dask, and say like, hey, compute me this result actually. So if you get, if you just print a statistic, right? It just say oh, the end result will be a Dask array, but it doesn't tell you what's in it. So now if we ask it to actually compute, then you get the values. Right, so this is still fairly new and it won't work for everything, but it will work like for a lot of your code if you know if you're just using regular functions and not too many magical magical things. All right, so there are some limits. Uh, I'll show, show you now a small example here of something that does not work. Um, so, for example, this numpy dot err state, right? It checks for invalid. So I tell it here, like, if you see an invalid, like a nan or an inf, right, raise an error. Um, so if you feed in like a numpy array that has a nan in it, because I just explicitly put one in here, right? I get an error, as I expect, because that's what I asked it to do. Now, if you do the same for QPy, right, there's also a NAN in here. Uh, but if I ask it to do something useful, like it doesn't raise an error, it just gives me the NAN back. Right? And that's because this error state that is not in QPy. Right? It's, it hasn't been overridden. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful still. And we're, at the moment, Talking about ways of like making this more comprehensive, uh, but you know, for really special objects, it's kind of hard to override them, right? because the idea is, you know, we override them by I give you an array and I check if the array has an array function thing, you know, attribute attached to it. But you know, in this in this case, this np state, there is no array input, so there is nothing to check, right? So we just need a different mechanism to allow overriding that. Uh, so the most important exceptions that don't work, uh, that you may be using a lot, are the array creation functions. If you have in the code that you write something that says, oh, np.array, you know, and then a list of values or something, right? That explicitly says, like, you know, I'm constructing a NumPy array, right? Y you can't check those individual values and say, like, oh, you know, you meant a QPy array or a PyTorch array here. And right? so if you have array, you know, Creating arrays, you want to separate those out of your function. And the function itself should just have your, let's call it your business logic. OK, so that, I think, is the, the single most important change we made in NumPy over the past three years or so. Um, so we, we now have, actually for the first time in ever, like we now have a few people that are paid to work on NumPy because we got a, a grant from the Moore Foundation. Oh, sorry, Moore and Sloan. Uh, so we have three engineers working on NumPy now. So there's a lot more interesting features coming, hopefully. Um, so these are kind of at a high level what we're planning to do. Uh, so the interoperability, so I call this array function interoperability. You know, we can now work better with you know, all these GPU objects and these distributed arrays. Um, so there will, be, there will be more of that. Um, so it becomes more complete and more robust. Because right now, like, we've basically just released it. And, you know, maybe you can start using it tomorrow, but there's not much code out there in other libraries that's using this. Uh, then extensibility. Um, so it's very hard to make custom D types. Everything is nice if you have just normal floats and ints and maybe date times. Right? But if you want to add like missing data support or you want to have arrays with units, that's a very popular one. There are like 10 different libraries that make arrays with units. So if you, you know, multiply meters by seconds, then you know, it's meters second. And if that's not what you wanted, you get you know, consistency checks that raise a flag. Um, that, that works today, but it's extremely hard. So the, the, there's, a, there's an example of a thing called um, 
quaternions, which is kind of a rotation matrix. I just looked at it as 1,600 lines of C code to make it the D type, that's the quaternion. Right? And it should be like, you know, maybe 100 lines of code. Uh, then performance. Uh, we haven't done a whole lot on performance. I mean, it's fast compared to Python, but you know, compared to Numba and you know, some of the newer things that have come in, it's starting to get slightly slower and more performance is always helpful. Right? That's why we like GPUs in the first place. So um, there will be ufunc optimizations to, to basically make every, every function in NumPy have less overhead and make it faster. Uh, there will be vector instructions. So if you have very large arrays, you know, the CPU has special instructions to process them in batches. Um, so we have some support for those, but it's incomplete at the moment. Um, so if you're on Linux and with GCC, then you know, it's a lot faster than if you're on some exotic platform with a compiler that's not GCC. And so it shouldn't be too hard to make that more complete. So that's, that's in the pipeline as well. Um, then Random number generation, there's a whole rewrite that's going to be, um, that's about to be merged. Uh, so that whole module is new. Um, it, it won't break your existing code, but there's a lot more options for faster samplers, samplers with more, you know, uh, with longer quasi periodicity. Um, then indexing, there will be new indexing behavior. Uh, if you've used X array, uh, that has in some cases more intuitive indexing. Uh, so if you give it, let's say, you know, uh, one, two, three, and you know, one, five, seven. It gives you like this. Uh, let's call it. I don't know how to call it, but it basically, it's more intuitive to see which elements will get selected. While this fancy in indexing in NumPy, it's often like a bit counterintuitive. So we'll add a new indexing, indexing mode basically. And then last one is type annotations. So um, that's going a bit slower. It's not the highest priority, but. It's nice to have for like understanding your code better and a bunch of other purposes. Okay, so let's see how much time do I have? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Okay. So that was kind of an, a brief overview of what's in NumPy, and you know, I'll, I'll also give an overview of what might be coming, you know, in the next few years, because. It's actually actually interesting. Like NumPy is like, you know, almost almost everybody here uses it at some point. Uh, but it's like because it is so old and it has such a large user base, it's kind of hard to evolve. Uh, so we don't know what's going to happen in a few years. We're going to keep pushing NumPy forward, but there will also be new new options, right? So I just there's no good way. I tried this for a really long time. This slide. There's no good way to put like all of these array libraries on a on, on two on a two dimensional picture. Right? Because some are really big, some focus on performance, some focus on new, you know, new features like you know, better missing data support, like like R has. Um, but the, the axes I chose here are uh, maturity, and then I divided in GPU or CPU or both, uh, and then I put in data frames as well. Maturity is kind of interesting because it's the, one of the first thing I think you should look at if you if you're trying to uh, use something new. Uh, if you want to live on the bleeding edge and see, you know, what everybody else will be using in five years, you know, you want to you want to probably be here somewhere. Uh, and if you just want code that works, you know, you want to be on this end. Um, and then I put a few things in gray, and I'll I'll, I'll do a few like U array. I'll, I'll talk about that in the last slides. Intensely, those are not really array objects, but they're kind of interfaces to them. And the same for arrow. In terms of data frames, like you've got pandas, you know, you got like the GPU version of pandas. Um, an arrow is kind of this interchange format that makes things work together better. Yeah. All right. So the first one I want to talk about is uh, XND. That's uh, it's a library that's about started two years ago, with the idea to take all the concepts of NumPy and create them as a number of individual libraries. So it's all more modular. It's very, you know for clean new C code. So there's three libraries, basically one for uh, an ar array container object, one for the actual data types, and a third one, how do you make functions on top of those two things. Uh, so it basically, it's, it's still you know, very young, so it might be not feature complete yet in places, but it, 
it's in terms of performance and features very similar to NumPy at the time. And then it has a whole bunch of things that we always wanted in NumPy, but you know, were always too hard to build, like variable length strings. If you work with strings, you probably have noticed that it, you know, those are really annoying to work with because there are no real variable length strings. So if you take a sentence and you break it up into words and you want to put them in an array, right, you have to make the data type of the array as long as the longest word that you have. And then when you encounter a longer word later, it doesn't fit and all your code breaks. Right? So XND has proper variable length strings, which means you know, it's easier to work with and it fits in less memory, so you can work with bigger data. Uh, then ragged arrays, same thing for, you know, if you have something that's not nicely square, so it fits in a, in a NumPy array or data frame, but it has various, various lengths, that's called ragged arrays, it has support for that. Um, and a few more things like, you know, easier D types, it has automatic multi-threading, which NumPy doesn't have. NumPy, if you install from Anaconda, you do get NumPy with MKL, you know, things run on all the, all the cores that you have. But by def if you just install NumPy with pip, you just get your single core by default, and you have to really try to parallelize it. Uh, so automatic multi-threading is nice. So if you do A plus B, you know, it runs you know, as fast as it can on all the hardware that you have. Uh, and then it also has JIT compilation, just like, just like NumPy via Numba. Um, show a brief example of that. So variable length strings, so it's like, this is a test notebook. Um, it tells you it, uh, the type is string, and you know it, it has five elements basically, right? Well, if you do this in NumPy, it's, uh, it tells you you know uh, you. So I guess for um, help me out of here, Unicode. Unicode of length eight, because this notebook is the longest word, so you know it needs eight characters. And now, you know. All of this, this A, you know, it's one character, but it also takes up the same space as the word notebook. Uh, and the same for ragged arrays, like, you know, you see, like, I in this case, you get type var, so variable length, basically. While in NumPy, if you try this, it kind of eats it, but it transfers everything to an object. And that's basically fairly useless. It's like, it's, it's in an array, but I don't know what it is, basically. It's like, it's just a reference to some object, and then you can't really process it very well. All right, next array library is Extensor. This is a very interesting one, especially if you're a C++ developer. Um, so they took all the concepts of NumPy, like broadcasting and indexing, and put them into C++, and then focused on performance and reusability. So, and it's really fast, it has lazy evaluation, so there are some problems where it's like, uh, you know, the fastest thing out there. Um, it can operate on NumPy arrays, you know, from C++ without doing any copying. And it has Python, Julia, and R bindings. So if, you, if you're a company and you want to ship your algorithm and you want to use it in Python and in R, or Python and in Julia, or all three, right, you, the idea is you, you write it with extensor in C++, so you get nice array semantics. Uh, you don't have to use just only the standard built-in. You know, things like broadcasting are really nice. They didn't exist in C++, C++ before. Um, but then, basically, you write it once, and you can get it into all of Python, Julia, and R. Uh, it also has JIT compilation, not via Numba, but via Python, um, which is you know, comparable in terms of performance. And then, I just noticed last month that R and now has this project called R-Ray, where some guy thought like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm stuck with R, I don't really like R, you know, it doesn't really have good arrays. Now they have NumPy-like arrays in R. So if you're an R user, like, check that out. Um, are we? Ah, yes. Okay, so I'll skip this example, but uh, go to the Extensor website. Um, you, can r you can use C++ interactively in the Jupyter Notebook. And last, I'll leave this up. Uh, U-Array is basically a, a generalization of the array protocols that I talked about. Uh, so that's, that's still a very young project, but that will allow you to override things like decorators and uh, classes and whatever you want. All right, then. thank you very much. <laughs>